Professor Einstein came to BU in 2012 after receiving her PhD in government and social policy at Harvard University. Her research and teaching interests broadly include urban politics and policy, racial and ethnic politics, and American public policy. Her first book, Do Facts Matter? Information and Misinformation in Democratic Politics, explores the harmful effects of misinformation on democratic politics. She is currently the co-principal investigator of the Menino Survey of Mayors, a multi-year data set of survey interviews of U.S. mayors exploring a wide variety of political and policy issues. Her work has been published in the American Journal of Political Science, the British Journal of Political Science, Political Behavior Journal, Presidential Studies, Presidential Studies Quarterly and Urban Affairs Review, as well as several edited volumes. Her research has been supported by grants from the National Science Foundation and the Russell Sage Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Einstein. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about rising costs in a different economic sector, in the housing sector. So this sort of follows on nicely. Um, and while talking about this economic sector, what I really want to try to answer is a big question. How should we enhance participation from underrepresented groups? So in response to rising political inequality, there have been a lot of efforts to address this issue at both the national and local levels. And you're probably really familiar with the national level efforts. There's been measures like early voting and same day registration designed to address these really significant political inequalities. At the local level, these efforts have focused on empowering neighborhood level participation in policy areas like schools and housing. So at the national level, we've identified some really key unintended consequences of these policies. It turns out in some cases, these policy measures may actually exacerbate rather than address the political inequalities they're supposed to solve. At the local level, the evidence has been decidedly more, been more mixed. So there's been some case studies that show that these neighborhood level institutions really work at empowering groups who aren't heard from. And there's other evidence that suggests that they might actually be empowering a really unrepresentative group. And so the central question that I'm going to talk about today is who participates at these community meetings and are they representative of their communities? So the case I'm going to use to look at this really big political question is housing policy. And I focus on housing policy for a couple of reasons. First, it's a relevant test case. So post-urban renewal, there's been a big move to have housing policy decisions at the neighborhood level involving community engagement. Um, this is also a really substantively important area, as I'm sure people in the Boston area are aware. So there's a nationwide affordability crisis, which introduces really significant equity concerns. And this is not just the case in New York, Boston, and San Francisco. Places like Milwaukee and Fargo are also seeing rising housing costs driven in part by insufficient housing supply. This is also a really key environmental question. To sustainably grow our cities, we need to be able to implement dense housing in, with multiple units. And the kind of community meeting dynamics I'm gonna talk about today might be hampering the ability of cities to construct this type of housing. Um, so just to give people a little bit of a background about how housing policy works and why I'm talking about community meetings in housing policy. So there's been an accumulation of land use regulations in many municipalities across the country that mean that any project that involves more than one housing unit has to go through multiple planning and zoning board meetings to be completed. And each of those meetings typically solicits input from the public. And they explicitly solicit input from abutters, who are people who live nearby a project. So cities or towns will send out official notifications to people who live within a 300-foot radius, informing them about a proposed development and meetings about that development. So what this does is it creates multiple veto points where the public can stop a housing project. And this could be a good thing if the big issue you're worried about is developer access. So if you're worried about corrupt developers, railroading neighborhoods, bulldozing communities, this is a really important check against that kind of access. But 
it might also be empowering an unrepresentative group. So one way that this group may be unrepresentative is sort of standard for people who think about political inequality at all. These individuals might be older, male, longtime residents, frequent voters, and homeowners. We also think they're going to be predisposed to oppose the development of new housing. So increasing this housing supply has concentrated costs and diffuse benefits. So imagine a housing project that proposes the construction of 10 new housing units. If you live next to that housing project, you're not going to be terribly happy about this in all likelihood. There's going to be construction noise. Maybe it's going to impede your view. And it's going to be a fairly dramatic change for your neighborhood, which for many people is really psychologically salient. In contrast, the 10 unit increase in housing it's going to increase the supply a little, which will have a marginal effect on costs of housing in that community, but it's not going to be a big noticeable benefit in terms of changes in housing costs. So it's unlikely to really motivate people to go out in support of this housing development. In addition, people who support the development of new housing are more likely to live outside of the jurisdiction where that housing is being proposed and therefore lack the information or efficacy to participate. So by definition, if you're negatively impacted by that 10 unit housing development, you probably live in the same jurisdiction and you live close by. In contrast, if you're going to benefit from that housing development, you might live two towns over and really want to move into that community because of the schools. Um, and so consequently, you're not going to be getting those abutters notices. And these aren't your local representatives that you're going to be able to talk to. So to look at this issue and try to figure out who's participating in these meetings, we downloaded all planning board and zoning board meeting minutes for 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts where open meeting laws give really cool details about the people who participate in these meetings. And we collected data from all meetings discussing the construction of more than one housing unit, which features everything from building in-law apartments inside your house to 50 unit apartment complexes. Um, and the meeting minutes for these towns, and this is the only state in the country where this kind of detail is available, have the names, addresses, and positions on proposed housing developments. In some cases, because the minutes are exact transcripts, we can actually learn the reasons that people support or oppose new housing too. And in total, we get 3,300 commenters and 4,200 comments. Um, and so just briefly, these are the cities and towns from which we have data. And the big takeaway I'd like for you to have from this map is there's a really varied set of places from which we gather data. So it's Massachusetts. It's going to be richer and whiter than the country as a whole. Um, that's just sort of demographically the problem with Massachusetts. But there's a wide variety of places here. So we have data from Worcester, Lowell, and Cambridge, and other places where there's some socioeconomic and racial diversity. So from these meeting minutes alone, we can learn really valuable information about how housing policy works in the United States. We can learn the percent of people who oppose the construction of new housing, and we can learn about their intensity of participation and the number of times they show up to meetings. Um, but the really cool thing about these data is we have names and addresses, which means we can merge this with the Massachusetts voter file. And the Massachusetts voter file, for people who don't know this, voter files have a lot of demographic information about people. So in Massachusetts, we can learn their age, their partisan identification, the length of registration at an address, which we can use as a proxy for how long you've lived there, and we can learn vote history. So we can't learn, importantly, race or income from the Massachusetts voter file. And we also can't learn about homeownership from the voter file, though we come up with another way to do that. So there's real limitations, just to put that out there, into what we can tell you and not tell you from these minutes. So here is a chart that shows you the um, just comparison of means between commenters on the left and non-commenters on the right. Um, all of these results for people who like stats hold under more sophisticated statistical models. This is the easiest way to display it. And we find, as we expected, that people who show up to these meetings are older, more likely to be men, um, more likely to be frequent voters, and more likely to be longtime residents of their communities. 
To look at home ownership, because we don't have home ownership data for all of Massachusetts, what we do is we focus on one town, the town of Arlington, and we look at Arlington for a couple of reasons. There's an even split between renters and homeowners, which is pretty unusual in our data. And there's also a large number of people who comment in Arlington. So we're not gonna try to draw conclusions from like five commenters. And what we do is we take those 85 people and we match them with deeds from the Middlesex County Registry of Deeds. And we find homeowners also overrepresented among people who participate in these meetings. There are almost 80% of meeting participants and only 60% of people living in Arlington. So a small minority of people in this whole Massachusetts data speak up at multiple meetings. So just under 20% of people speak multiple times, while the average person makes 1.3 comments, 45 people show up to five or more meetings to talk about housing development. And I'll tell you in a minute sort of what those people's positions are. Um, the only predictor of whether you show up to multiple meetings is partisanship. So Republicans are significantly more likely to make multiple comments. As we expected, people are overwhelmingly opposed to housing policy, opposed to the construction of new housing if they show up to these meetings. So 62% of people commenting at these meetings oppose the construction of new housing, while only 15% of people who show up to speak at a planning or zoning board meeting show up in support of this housing. The remaining 23% ask neutral questions about sort of how a housing construction process will work. The predictors of opposition, Republicans are more likely to oppose the construction of new housing. Those frequent commenters I told you about on the previous slide, also more likely to oppose the construction of new housing. And infrequent voting is also a predictor of opposition. So we also, for about half of the people who commented at these meetings, can tell you why they commented the way they did. Um, and here you can see a chart showing the different categories and reasons people cited. I think the big takeaways here, one, people talk about a lot of different things um, when they're talking about housing. So they'll complain about traffic. They'll complain about how ugly a building is. So they, they bring up a lot of different things. And the things they bring up vary depending upon whether they support or oppose the construction of new housing. We also have a bit of qualitative insight from these transcripts. So unsurprisingly, people will talk about the context of their community, right? So they'll talk about how the water pressure is and whether the septic system in their community works well. They'll talk about whether all their neighbors have had flooding in their basement. What we thought was really interesting and really striking was the incredibly high level of expertise from the people who show up to comment at these meetings. So multiple people in our data cite their experiences, lawyers, engineers, architects, real estate professionals, and have an incredible level of specific knowledge about zoning codes. So this is just one example of an engineer from Andover who um, seems to know a lot about traffic studies and um, has some sense of how the zoning process works. All right, so why should you care about these people? Um, I've spent a lot of time telling you about the 3,300 people who speak up at Massachusetts uh, community meetings. So there's a couple of different ways these people could have a real policy impact and shape the affordability of housing in the places you all live. The first is that these people could just be really persuasive and they could convince board members that a housing project is a good or bad idea. The second is these individuals could signal important electoral consequences. So if a large group of people shows up to a community meeting, that could tell someone on the city council or on the board of selectmen that it would be a really bad idea to approve this project um, because they might lose their seat. We think the big one, though, is that people showing up to these meetings signals a willingness to file lawsuits or at least threaten lawsuits, which we know from economics research is a big obstacle to development. So multiple people who attended these meetings, we find that they are either lawyers themselves or they attend the meetings with lawyers. In a couple cases, we actually could link the people who commented at these meetings with actual lawsuits filed in the Massachusetts land court on the development in question. And so instead of operating as a way that um, empowers underrepresented groups to speak out about housing, these community meetings 
are allowing a small and unrepresentative group of individuals to play a significant role in obstructing the development of housing in places that desperately need to uh, construct new units. So thank you. Look forward to questions. Hello. Um, so I am from Arlington, Massachusetts. Hi. Um, um, and I f understand a lot of what you're saying because Arlington does have a lot of discussion about, you know, building new houses. We need it. There are a lot of people who are, you know, drawn to Boston, drawn to the cities, and they're trying to, you know, find areas to live. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue a lot of people talk about is that, you know, building more houses doesn't necessarily drive down costs mm -hmm. for housing, and there are a lot of issues with, um, you know, traffic and density and such. So in your professional opinion, um, what are some ways that, you know, you can, I guess, pros and cons? Like, why would you encourage housing, and how would you get around issues such as, you know, traffic and density in this type of scenario? Right. So the first issue, um, so I live in Arlington too, so <laughs> I, uh, I definitely have heard a lot of these discussions firsthand. And um, what I would say to this issue, so a lot of people who oppose housing talk about this exact issue that you raise, that if uh, the places where we're seeing the rapid construction of housing are also, like, we're not seeing the costs go down, right? Like, San Francisco has seen a lot of housing get built, and the costs are still absolutely insane there. Um, but the issue is for people who've taken economic classes, um, you've probably heard the term counterfactual. What you have to think about is the alternative world in which no ha new housing got built. So new housing is getting built in places where costs are going up because otherwise developers would have no reason to build there, right? So there's not a lot of developers who are clamoring to build big multifamily housing in Detroit. So. Um, they're concentrating their efforts and building in places where there's already a huge amount of demand. And so even if they're building new housing, odds are the costs are still going to go up because they're high demand places. And so the real question we have to ask is would prices have gone up even more had we not constructed that new housing? Economists think the answer is yes. Um, but there is still some debate about that um, between sort of political activists who think about this issue. Um, and the second issue you raise is an important one. Traffic is a big issue in the Boston area and in a lot of these other communities like New York, San Francisco, where there's been a lot of rapid growth. Um, I think the real answer here is that these kinds of developments need to be coupled with better mass transit access. Um, we can't continue to have sort of car-based commuting, particularly when we're thinking about inner core suburbs, places you know, for people familiar with the Boston area, places like Arlington, Belmont, Watertown. These are all places where there should really be better transit access into the city, given the number of people who are commuting into the city from those communities. And so, yes, serious concerns. Um, the third one people actually raised too, um, just to flag it because post Houston, I think this has come up a lot in the news, is serious environmental concerns. A lot of the open parcels left, particularly in places like Boston, but elsewhere too, are in flood zones. And so we really have to think sensibly about what are the ways that we develop communities responsibly so that we're not reducing the amount of permeable space available um, and contributing to flooding challenges. Hi there. Hi, Monica. Um, I had a question about something that wasn't explicitly mentioned in your presentation, which is something I'm more familiar with coming from Toronto, um, which is uh, foreign buyers uh, uh, taking up space, I guess, and driving up the housing, uh, going crazy because of that. Um, my cousin who lives in BC recently said that they've instituted like a foreign, foreign buyers tax and things like that that might like stabilize the situation and now know this is the case in San Francisco and other big cities, but what is your take on, you know, 
that. <laughs> yeah, so the stuff I'm talking about in this presentation is by no means the only driver of rising housing costs. Like even if we eliminated community meetings, um, which I am not proposing as a policy solution, um, and if people are interested, I'm happy to talk at the reception more about what some more sort of sensible policy solutions might be. But there are a lot of other issues at play. And yeah, this foreign buyers issue is a really serious one. Um, to some extent in Boston, but it's a really big problem. As you put it, Vancouver is, I think, the one that sort of was most famously um, uh, highlighted in a lot of media accounts as having this issue. And then once Vancouver passed the foreign buyers tax, then Toronto became the target for all this foreign money. Um, so that's a huge issue. London is another place where this has been a major problem with sort of entire blocks basically silent as they've been bought up by foreign money. And I think the most effective policy solution that we know of is this one that you brought up is foreign buyers tax, but yeah. Um, hi. hi. Uh, oh. God, sorry. Uh, this might be outside, I guess, the um, realm of your research, mm -hmm. but you know, hearing you talk and then also, I, I'm coming from Austin, Texas, so there's a lot of the same, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of traffic and stuff. Yeah. And it seems like, so much of the time we end up playing catch up, right? So like an area becomes popular and then suddenly everyone wants to move there. Then you have problems with traffic. Then, you know, you have development and then you you run the risk of having a real estate bust or something mm -hmm. that's localized and can be really detrimental. Is there any research to suggest uh, like a kind of trend that we can start looking for to say maybe this city mm -hmm. is will be an, an, a very popular city in the next coming years, or is that just not really worth the time? No, people definitely do this. And I think the way you look at this right now is you look at the cities where there's a large percentage of highly educated people already living there because the companies that are sort of most profitable in the economy right now are looking for highly skilled workers. And so that's one reason that you are living in what is now becoming one of the most expensive cities in the country because of the extraordinary number of people who have bachelor's degrees who live here and form the workforce for hospitals, universities, biotech, um, and just standard tech companies, right? So I think if, if I were to try to look to see where the places that are going to have the work, worst housing crises, they would be along the lines of places that have the highest percent of bachelor's degrees and have a huge number of land use regulations and just constrained land areas in general. So places that are surrounded by water, for example, are going to have those issues too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the point about catch up is a really important one. And I think if we had invested more in infrastructure as a country, we would probably have less of a housing crisis right now because we would be able to sort of build housing in more outlying places and have good rail access to bring people into cities. So no, thank you. Um, and I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, so thanks everyone. <laughs> <laughs>